Welcome to the West Side Podcast. Each week, we'll take a relevant topic under the microscope to see what the Bible has to say about it. You will gain tools and information you need to support your faith walk and build Christ-centered families in Kansas City and beyond. I'm your host, Troy Kennedy. Well, over the past several weeks, we've been tackling some really difficult issues through the lens of what Jesus would have to say about them. Sanctity of life, racial uh, racial reconciliation, sanctity of marriage, and justice for the poor are all hot-button topics for today. And once again, we're putting Pastor Randy Frazee on the hot seat, (laughs) but this time he's here to answer your questions. We've received a bunch of different questions over the last few weeks as we've covered these really important topics. And what we try to do is kind of log them and pull the ones out that seem to have been pertinent to the, the topics that we've been discussing over these weeks. In addition to that, the, when we start our next season of the podcast, we're going to take some of the questions that you have offered up, and those are going to become full topics, of full episodes for discussion. So be looking for us in the next few weeks in our new studio, which we're yeah. going to have. Right For those of you who are watching on YouTube, we're going to be in a whole new studio, not this little room with the lovely octagons here <laughs> behind us and uh, we'll get a chance to um just to continue this dialogue this conversation this equipping tool we believe god has given to us so yeah. Randy, thanks man thanks for being yeah here. exciting and excited to hear uh the number of people that are responding to this it's accomplishing the yeah. mission that we had uh in setting out for, to do it we're enjoying doing it and um i'm super proud to be able to uh have a group of people in our church and beyond that are listening to this and it provides you and i yeah. a venue that we don't have like on a sunday morning or whatever right. uh where we don't have as much time or you know it's just it this this kind of a format and uh you know this is not for the faint of heart you know we're not trying to produce a, a sound bite we're trying to get into the issues and and you know we're not the smartest light bulbs in the chandelier on all these topics <laughs> But um, hopefully we're a trusted source and that you're trusting that where we're leading you to maybe do some further study and all that might be really good. So super super. And so these issues can be really complex. They are more than often you can cover in the context of a, you know, a message on a Sunday morning in half an hour. And I think having the dialogue and having the opportunity for you to respond to us and to further continue the dialogue has been really important. So some of the questions that we got from you that we're going to attempt to address today, if nothing else, to point you back to Jesus as a source of uh, everything good and everything that we're trying to accomplish in this world. Some of the questions we got back from you are, and, and how to discuss some of these difficult issues with your children um, have issues related to uh, the transgender questions, sex before marriage. Believe it or not, socialism came up as a topic of conversation and talking about other religions. And so um, also how to navigate gender fluidity in a world with truth and love and how to live in peace in a world of chaos. And that probably is the best place for us to start. Yeah, you know, I want to uh, think, of, first of all, you know, someone specifically, re- you know, said, hey, loving the podcast, I'd like help as a parent of teens, mm-hmm. uh, mama for teenagers. And I just, uh, you know, t- you know, talk about things like socialism and you know what? You know, so one thing would be, what food do you pair with socialism? You know, <laughs> but I wanna, I, I wanna, I wanna like f- settle in just for a second to, into the person who sent this email in, mm-hmm. who's got a passion to be involved in in helping her right. for the teenagers, children, yeah. uh, really, because this is where this thing's got to start. And there are mm-hmm. other cultures that are thinking multiple generations out, right. and you know, we're pacing in front of a microwave type mm-hmm. of society. So I wanted to say that that's a right question, and the church cannot win the battle for your kids heart and mind on our own Mm -hmm. that we have to have the parents engage with us uh, and that's a super high calling that we have uh, to come alongside of the parents so for the for the for the mom that's writing this in this is we got to have more of this may her tribe increase Um, I would say just now not looking at teenagers but just kind of a a little bit of a way that I looked at things Mm -hmm. uh, raising our four kids our youngest is now 36 and our, our oldest is 36 and down to 28 in, uh, we, we applied a, th- a, th- a thing on situational leadership um, that to parenting. We call it situational parenting. And I'm going to be teaching on it in our family series this oh. summer coming up. And it's basically from ages uh, birth to five or six is the directional phase. Mm-hmm. And so you don't need your kids to understand. I think a lot of parents make right. the mistake with their little kids. Oh, I want you to understand, Johnny. Try you to know, rationalize with Yeah, them. because they yeah. remember being parented maybe, by, you know, as a teenager. And they're, and they're they, yeah, they don't, you don't rationalize. You know, if your kid is in, you know, it, it, you know uh, does something that is inappropriate, 
uh, in, 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 in relation to, to racial issues, for example, you don't need to reason with them. You just stop them. Right. You know, you just direct them. And then from, uh, you know, age six, seven, you know, all the way to age 12, you move into the coaching phase. And this mm-hmm. is a thing that most parents miss. And that is, you know, you watch me, mm-hmm. uh, you, you watch me. And, and I think that a lot of parents miss this phase where the, the biggest megaphone you have in these formative years between 6 and 12 are the way you're living your life. Mm-hmm. And so if you don't want, you know, if you don't want, you know, want them to think about these things and ask yourself the question. You know, a lot of times when it came, uh, you know, growing up, uh, you know, and, and uh, the biblical mandate to respect uh, people in office, you know, like mm-hmm. the president of the United States, and uh, and you want to ch- teach your children respect for authority, right? right? And yet you're always trashing the president mm-hmm. at your home, whatever your Republican right. Democrat, it doesn't matter. And then and then you say you need to have, be respectful of authority. Right. Like, well, you don't do that. It's more caught than taught. It is, and I think that that second phase is extremely mm-hmm. formative. But then when you get to a, uh, ages 13 to 22, 18 to 22, uh, it's the, you move to the support phase. Before they leave your nest, you're saying, okay, you've watched me. Now I'm going to watch you mm-hmm. and give you some feedback. And, and a lot of parents fail to uh, enter into that phase, right. which is the phase that this lady is talking about here. And then at 23, you got to move into delegation. you got to basically mm-hmm. say, I gave it my best shot, and uh, you know, th- this is your life, and you've got you to run with it. I'm not going to support your bad choices right. financially or whatever. Uh, and I would think another uh, big idea. So that's so one is like make sure you're parenting in the right phase. Um, and I think where most parents get off is that they they finally figured out that they need to they needed to be directional, uh, but they wait till their kids are teenager and they right. lose their kids because they're directing them in heavy handedness. That concept of exasperating your right. kids right. because you're directing them at age 17 right. when that was the phase when they were between birth and six, mm-hmm. and you got to learn how to sort of maneuver in the different seasons. Another thing is to make sure you lay a biblical foundation for them to think from. Mm-hmm. You know, so they just can't think about issues. They have to have a biblical worldview, right. and that's one of the things that. I tried to accomplish in the belief series with the 30 big ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I did as a parent, you don't have to use the 30 big ideas, you know, beliefs, practices, and virtues, but particularly the beliefs, is um, we we put them on cards for all of our kids with the key verse, key idea. And uh, we taught all of our kids, they all memorized them. And then uh, when they hit the teenage years where they're developmentally able to begin kind of thinking, Mm -hmm. like 12 years of age, uh, we, at, at night, at dinner, for several years, we would present a case study. Like if we were doing one as we're recording this today, it, we would bring the case study of the people sort of uh, uh, going after the Capitol, you know, building. Right. And, 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 and they, all they could respond to is they had, they had these 30 cards in front of them at dinner, and they couldn't just like start talking. They had to pick a card and says, I think that uh, the authority of the Bible has something to do with this one, you know, okay. you know, the God's Word, or I think salvation. Uh, yeah. And so they would begin to attach these mm-hmm. big biblical ideas to their thoughts. And I was amazed at how good. So you got to give them a biblical foundation right. from which to come from. They can't be just thinking about, you know, sex before marriage and socialism mm-hmm. up here from just, you know, what they're getting in the news right. or what they're learning in school. They've got to apply a biblical framework. Well, the question is, do your kids have one? Mm-hmm. So that's what, what, what we did. And then you have to develop a culture of conversation, you know, and so uh, a, a lot of times um, when your kids are teenagers, you can't direct them to your outcome. You can't say, I'm, a, I'm for socialism, mm-hmm. and therefore we're going to have a conversation, and as long as you lean in that mm-hmm. direction, then we're going to have a good time here. you got to be able to create a culture of, of, of uh, give and take, and they're testing out their ideas. Mm-hmm. And I even oftentimes took the devil's advocate for right. the position I was, least, I was least for because then it caused them to sort of be on the side of defending the idea that I, was, I felt was more biblically inclined. Most families do not have a culture of conversation. They right. just cannot have a intelligent conversation where ideas are shared freely, and parents want their kids to line up to their ideals, and that's fine when they're three years old, mm-hmm. but it ain't fine when they're a teenager. And uh, the last thing I would say is it really practical is uh, have your teenagers listen to the podcast, which mm. I think is have them listen to the podcast mm-hmm. and then have a discussion on it. And uh, and again, I said try to play the devil's advocate and to see if they can defend the position you feel like best 
matches the scriptural bit. So I talked a lot yeah. there, but I really thought this question was so great. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about content, but it's about an environment, about mm -hmm. how you approach parenting uh, in a healthy way that will help uh, help these situations. Well, let me ask you a couple of quick things in regards to that. So one, many parents might be in the position where their kids, maybe the toothpaste is kind of out of the tube, you know, the kids are old enough and the kids are, uh, one, they're not in a position to receive well from them because maybe they were dictatorial or yeah. maybe maybe they were uh, inconsistent, right? They didn't see that kind of integrity. So now they're dealing with the fruit of that with their children. And secondly, um, you know, since you, if you've already gotten that far, but these kids are navigating this really, I mean, we didn't deal with anything like this no. when we were, <laughs> were at that age. How would you coach a parent who feels like they're just behind the eight ball? Like yeah, I th and again, that's why I want to say to the younger parents who might be listening, you don't want to get behind the eight ball because you're mm -hmm. you, we move at the speed of trust, right? We talk about that, and um, and and basically, you want to have wisdom in how you parent your kids so that you have this relationship with them. But right. if you are in that situation, I think you're going to have to address it. Mm -hmm. I might even go to the point where I'd say, you know, should we do a counseling session to talk it through, right. um, and um, you know, should we meet with the pastor or something? like that to say we've got to try to get it to the place where they'll even hear you mm -hmm. and um and and or the other thing that might uh, be beneficial is to bring in uh some other adults in their life uh, a youth pastor or even you know, in my case in in neighborhoods we had families in our neighborhood that had done exactly that you know they, there's no way they would never they would never share with their their parents anything because their parents would either ride them or whatever and so their parents would send them down to our table and uh, and uh, right. we would we would often have Hearing three it from another source from yep. another angle yeah and and helpful. they would learn they would learn mm -hmm. about this uh, and then we'd eventually bring the parents to the table as well mm -hmm. and then over time they 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 were able to to do that so if you've kind of maybe blown it and God offers forgiveness right. uh, you know draw into some uh, other people that your kids can be around right. that can uh, that can help you while you're rebuilding trust right. and I would say too on top of that you know Randy is he's you know been a wonderful teacher for decades and he's got these frameworks for teaching and has taught churches how to do these kinds of things. Um, I just say just from a maybe in a more simple framework, you know, if you, that feels overwhelming for you, <laughs> um, I would just say this, you know, we talk about having hope in the midst of chaos. Our hope is grounded in the character of God as, as it's revealed in Jesus. So Jesus is always going to be the clearest view of God that we ever have. And I would say that Jesus is the interpretive lens through which we see everything, the world we live in and the world of scripture. And so if we can just kind of keep a couple of those simple things in our minds, like, look, if I really want to understand, well, how would Jesus navigate this situation? Look to him, look to scripture, seek counsel from pastors and teachers and people who are wiser than you, and you are, and, and even pointing your kids to the person of Jesus, not necessarily, that's going to sound weird, but not necessarily the scope of Scripture, mm -hmm. but to the person of yeah. Jesus as the source of hope. And, we, you know, we won't go through all these Scriptures. I'll put these in our notes. But just to say that uh, in the New Testament, the writers of, of the Gospels and the Apostle Paul, they're very clear about how Jesus is the source and the center, the interpretive center of everything uh, about the way we truly understand God. And so... Um, we need to see everything through this Christocentric lens. And so our starting point then is one, seeking counsel, seeking wisdom, meeting the kids where they are in their developmental journey, yep. right? And I would say a couple of things. Um, an interpretive principle when we look at some of the chaos in the world is, one, you don't interpret what is clear by what is unclear. Mm -hmm. You interpret what is unclear by what is clear. So if we're talking about <clears throat> trends, or if we're talking <clears throat> about marriage, or if we're talking about violence, or whatever the <clears throat> issue is, Generally, there is a very clear view, something we actually know a lot about. Like, for instance, we know a lot about male and female, yeah. right? We don't know a ton about trans and so, uh, or intersex people or, or those different things that will come up a little bit later. So just really important to understand, even when you look at scripture, we interpret what is maybe unclear by what is fully clear and visible to us. And another, another piece is, you know, we st our starting place is all souls are made in the image of God. They are loved, deserving of dignity, deserving of love, deserving of respect as people made in the image of our Creator. And if we start in that place and we look into somebody's eyes, regardless of whether we disagree with them, whether we condone their behavior or their uh, the way that they live, we can love them and respect them and have a meaningful dialogue that um, 
isn't constantly tainted by by our disagreement. I can disagree with you and care about you and love you. And so th- that's, that's our starting place here. And uh, so we've got a, a bunch of topics we want to try and get through. And that was just wanted to, important to give you guys a bit of a framework on how we're approaching these things. And uh, one of the first topics we had that came up was, hey, Randy, what about sex before marriage? Uh-huh. Okay, you want to do that one? <laughs> All right. What are your thoughts on that one? That, that's, uh, sex before marriage. Well, the first, very first thing I would do is invite uh, people to listen to the podcast where mm-hmm. we already chatted about this and talked about it in length. But now we're really uh, looking at how do we think about this, maybe how do we communicate it to others, mm-hmm. maybe to our kids. And uh, so I would listen to the previous podcast. And I think a reminder, something that we've already said, but a good reminder is God is good and he's not taking away something from us, but he's saving us uh, for something which is best for us. Mm-hmm. And um, and w- you have to get to know God to believe that he has the character of being a good God, which mm-hmm. is why worship and prayer and being in Christian communities, mm-hmm. all these things that you and I have harped over all of our lives right. are really important. Those spiritual disciplines draw you closer to a God to discover through the experiences of life that he's good and that a good God, I may not feel it in the moment, but he's trying to save me for what is best and uh you know you and i are both married to our brides for i just i'll hit 40 years this year yeah. and uh and uh you know god you know the, the old testament talks about the wife of your youth and you and i are both experiencing that by god's grace you know uh and by the just the discipleship in our lives you know and by the goodness of our wives to hang with us through the stupid years uh you know we've really been able to see the truth i can see how this is better than than the alternative now for me i'm going to say something super unpopular but i think i've got biblical basis for it and that is i think that uh maybe people today are marrying too late Mm. They're marrying too late right. uh, compared to the biblical pattern. You know, we see that, you know, uh, you know, Mary was likely 16. She could have even been 14, but we don't like to say that. Right. So we say, say she was six, 16. Uh, you know, uh, in scriptures, uh, for example, 1 Corinthians 7, 9 says, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry rather than burn with passion. Mm-hmm. And here's the deal. Um, again, this is like not never really thought about, and uh, yeah, I might regret talking about it right here. <laughs> you know, but this is really... <laughs> Ob- here's an obvious thing, okay, uh, because I think people are already be pushing back from this, but here's the thing. So God created the body, and right around the puberty era, mm-hmm. you know, is when, you know, we're, you know, you know, basically we can start having children, and our passion is starting to mm-hmm. run. And, uh, and, and back in biblical days, you know, uh, that's when they were thinking about getting married, when the giant is being released, mm-hmm. you know, in us, and particularly men. And for us to say... You know, we shouldn't get married early. We need to mature a little bit more. I get that argument Mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, maybe 30 or 35 or whatever. uh, But I'm just telling you, as it relates to sex before marriage, it's really hard to have the giant released Mm -hmm. at the age of 15 and then wait to 30 to just, I mean, you got to be pretty 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 special person to be able to do that so you're really set up for failure so i, I would just encourage people you right. know uh i got married at 20 you know and you'd say you say uh why why so why at 20 i says well because it was illegal to get married in cleveland at 15 <laughs> you know <laughs> Roseanne and i started sitting in church at 15 right. and uh, there's a lot of blessings well, to you, that. you know when i was i mean i can speak to this a little bit because i got married when i was 30 years old mm, yeah and okay. um i gotta tell you man it was that was brutal mm-hmm. um now my wife is the only woman I've ever been with, but uh, but doesn't mean I don't have plenty of regrets yeah. attached to my sexuality and relationships I had with with women in college, even women after college. Um, there's a lot of soul damage attached to yeah. that inappropriate physical intimacy that wasn't attached to actual commitment. Yeah, and. Um, but having waited, you know, so long yeah. and uh, for lots of lots of reasons, I just I sympathize so much with young men who are, you know, in their college years, early 20s, you know, and they're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to stay pure. And you can't help but wonder, man, wouldn't it have been great if you were 18, 19, 20 and you only know, gotten married and then you could grow together with someone and not have this mammoth struggle 
all the time because that hormonal thing is so powerful. It's a passion. It's burn with passion. In the in the Greek, it's it's super duper intense. And it says better to marry than to burn with passion. And a lot of negative things. And you you've talked about it. You know, in terms of relationships, in terms right. of damage, and in terms of children coming into the world. Right. You know that kind of thing. Matter of fact, the next point I have is the. Uh, the principal function of sex in scripture is procreation. I mean, it's what it is, dude. Right. I mean, we may not sound very sexy, but that's what it is. Uh, you know, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 says, Be fruitful and increase in number. And uh, we see the devastation throughout mm -hmm. human history when people, groups, have controlled, tried to control population. Matter right. of fact, Christianity made huge grounds in the first three centuries because it wasn't, uh, it wasn't aborting their children and all mm -hmm. that. And we just, by sheer numbers, overtook the pagans. And right. the other thing I would say when um, uh, ple there, there is pleasure in sex, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that that is God's gift. And uh, I, I'll kind of restrain some of the humorous things I could say uh, right now, uh, but, uh, the, but but sex is pleasurable, and God created that right. as a secondary kind of benefit. Mm -hmm. When, however, pleasure, selfish pleasure, becomes the driver of right. the experience, then it gets off base. The purpose is of sex is between a man and a woman with the intent of having mm -hmm. a child, okay? Right. And it's a pleasurable experience as a secondary deal. When the pleasure becomes the driver versus then we're off of God's uh, uh, off of God's plan. Right. And I think that the central driver um, to convenience abortions is sex for pleasure. In other words, I want pleasure, I'm burning with passion, and therefore I'm gonna engage in sex with no intent of being, you know, of, of first yeah. being married and of the intent of creating a family under God's authority. And I think what happens when you have sex, which was intended to procreate, you have a baby and you're like, well, this is not what I intended. It's not what I wanted. Right. And so either the boy or the girl, whatever, somebody or the parent is forcing mm -hmm. the convenient uh, 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 abortion. And, uh, and I would say a couple other things, and then you can pipe in. Mm -hmm. uh, a girl will often give herself to a man, uh, a girl will often give herself to a man before marriage, sexually, thinking this will secure his commitment mm -hmm. to me. And I'm just telling you, that is a lie. Right. Uh, and because we're guys, that's, you know, we'll take it. Uh, but you're, you're, you, you've lowered, actually lowered his respect for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had one gal uh, in San Antonio told her boyfriend, he, he says, I will need both rings before you get that. Mm -hmm. And if you remember the old tradition, you used to have the, right. the one the ring and the other, the other engagement ring. He says, you're going to need to put the second one on me before <laughs> you get that. I loved her attitude for that. Uh, I would say that premarital sex is also a driver for causing people to live together. And we talked mm -hmm. about this on our, right. our podcast on that. Marriage, and yeah. while this may be a reaction to the failure and pain of broken marriages but that you may have grown up with, uh, it's not a good response. In other words, a lot of people are living together because they saw their parents uh, get a divorce. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, over 50 percent of the people today have been in uh, homes that ended in divorce. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think a little bit about that right. as a kid. And uh, and so consequently, the idea of living together, let's try this out. What, what they say is, though, you've lowered the bar of entry. When mm -hmm. I got married, I canceled the wedding on the first time because I wasn't sure about it. <laughs> I mean, I, if I'm going to get married, I'm going to be completely committed to this thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not, there's no way out of this thing. Uh, yeah. But uh, people that live together go like, well, well there's a complete way out of it. We're going to live together, mm -hmm. and if it doesn't work, we're done because they right. think of marriage as being for themselves and not for the bigger picture of God. And what ends up happening is that uh, they don't know how to get out of it. And as a result, uh, they don't exit it, and they end up getting married with this low bar of commitment. And we talked about it last time. Right. Statistically, uh, it's it not that well. it doesn't go really well. The last thing I would say is all of us survive with healthy accountability in our life. Right. And this is not just related to sex before marriage and sexual kind of things, uh, but um, we need boundaries in our life. And so as it comes back to the parenting thing, um, I mean, parents, you, uh, you know, you don't want to be your kid's friend. They have lots of friends, but only one mom, only right. one dad. And you need to create boundaries. And I would say that's not only true for teenagers, but I know Roseanne and I, we have built-in boundaries in our relationship uh, and how that we do things. It's longer than most people's list that make many people feel uncomfortable. But we pray to God every day that we finish this race uh, united as one in marriage. What do you, what do you think? Well... I mean, gosh, that was really uh, wonderful kind of to delineate those things. And I would say one thing is, you know, Scripture talks clearly about sex before marriage, and the word it uses very often is fornication. Mm -hmm. yep. And you see that seems like an old school word, but it's just God's way of saying, 
uh, look, this sex outside of the covenant commitment of marriage, like we can go refer back to our uh, episode on the sanctity of marriage for mm-hmm. a lot more on that, mm-hmm. is called fornication. It is outside of God's guidelines, his bounds for you. And I was... It's like God's not trying to keep something from you. Mm-hmm. He's not. He's not this like like a uh, cosmic buzz kill. You know, yeah. he's not looking down saying, "Hey, let's see if they can do this one." You know, yeah. like high five. You know, I, I won a bet with Gabriel because they couldn't <laughs> do it. That's not the point. It's because God is trying to give something to you, not keep something from you. Mm-hmm. I think about. Um, I, I've given this example with before uh, when my boy was five years old. You know, he wanted to play with the stove, and I wouldn't let him play with the stove, and he was so mad at me. Yeah. You know, he's like, you're such a buzzkill, Dad. You're something, you know, <laughs> and you're trying to control me. You know, I was <laughs> like, no, no, I know things that you don't know about this. Right. I understand. I have a perspective that you can't have on <laughs> right. what could happen to you. You can hurt yourself. You could burn the house down. There's lots of bad things that can happen yeah. here. So I'm not trying to control you. I'm trying to save you from mm. something for something better. Yeah. And what, what our society has done is we've reduced sex to a physical act, but it's a lie. Mm-hmm. Because intuitively, we all know more. It's a lot more than a physical act. You wouldn't tell uh, a woman who was sexually assaulted and say, oh, you know, we're, it's just your body, mm-hmm. right? We intuitively know that it's a spirit thing. We mm-hmm. wouldn't tell a child who's been molested and say, oh, it's, he's okay, it's just his body. There's something deeply in our psyche and in our soul attached to that kind of physical intimacy. Mm-hmm. And I would say that God's trying to give you the best part of that intimacy Mm -hmm. in the context of an unconditional commitment so that that sexual relationship isn't performative Mm -hmm. it's it isn't conditional it is something that seals the relationship in an emotional physical spiritual kind of a way so um just just to say that it's a whole lot more than just having fun with someone Mm -hmm. or just you know easing your frustrations and i understand it's easy to say when you've been married, I've been married for 23 years. You've been married a whole lot longer than that. And, mm-hmm. um, but Randy's got a point, you know, it's like, maybe, maybe it's a good idea for us to start getting married earlier and figure out how to navigate this thing in a way that honors God and honors our design. Yeah. And you know, that going back again, I think the most practical thing for a teenager is like, um, do you want the best? Mm-hmm. Here's the deal. You, if you, if you, if you want the best, you're going to have to trust God because everything in you is going to want to, 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 right. to settle for less. Mm-hmm. And uh, once you settle for less, uh, God can forgive and redeem and move it forward, right. but you've given up the best. So it's mm-hmm. not like it's a, it's an in, you know, like a, it's a, one, a, one, a one-time decision. If you want to be saved for the best, mm-hmm. then you got to make a commitment today um, right. to uh, preserve yourself for the best. And if you don't, God's there. God's a forgiving God. And, uh, uh, and, uh, um, and you can move on from there, which most people do. And this community thing, you know, I mean, most people are doing it today, you know, mm-hmm. kind of thing. Right. So you think, why am I so different? You know, I'm not mm-hmm. different. I, everyone's done. There can't be anything wrong yeah. with this. It's hard to swim upstream, you know, but, uh, but the truth is, is if we, we go back to what I said before, we trust the character of God as it is revealed in the person of Jesus. Yeah. And if Jesus loves me, this I know, mm-hmm. and I trust him because of who he is, then I'm going to trust that he knows better. Yeah. And I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, this is hard, yeah. but I'm going to go ahead and walk in obedience to you and trust you with the consequences. Yeah. Um, so let's take a hard right here. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> socialism. Yeah. How do we talk about socialism? I got to leave the room for a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. This is a very deep, very, very sexy conversation. My boy has told me, Troy, uh, dad, don't ever say sexy. So I, yeah. <laughs> I apologize <laughs> now. Never say that word. Socialism. So there's a... Important distinction between socialism as an economic policy yeah. and socialistic practices. For instance, in the United States, we have socialized education, right? We've got public school system. We have social security. That's a social, even you could say the military is kind of a socialistic sort of an institution versus socialism, which is an economic policy, which can be best summarized in the government owning the means of production, like a place like Venezuela, that where mm-hmm. the government took over the oil industry and mm-hmm. took over transportation and took over communication. And so when we talk about socialism, one, 
um, it's not referring to places like Scandinavia, where uh, like back when Bernie Sanders was running for uh, for office in 2016, he was pointing to Denmark, saying, you know, we need to be more like Denmark and Sweden. And, and the Prime Minister of Denmark got went out of his way to say, quit referring to us as a socialist country. We are an open market economy, oh. right? We are a capitalist economy. Now, Sweden and Denmark, they are capitalist economies with very high taxes and a large welfare state. So they have a lot of social programs, right. but they are not a socialist economy. As a matter of fact, if you look at Sweden, um, there's no minimum wage, right? There's no uh, wealth tax. Their social security system is privatized. Um, there's a lot of things like that in, in, in their system that look very, very different even from the U.S. They have less regulation on their businesses than the United States does, but they have a very high taxes. Mm -hmm. They have something called a, a VAT tax, a value-added tax, which is about 25% on everything you buy. So very high sales tax is what we would call so it. So it's open capitalistic, meaning you make the money, they're just going to take a lot of right. it. Right. But the government doesn't own the means of production, Got which it. is what socialism is. Now, I would say this, uh, purely socialistic uh, or countries who have practiced socialism, good examples would be uh, Israel, after they got formed um, in 1948, they actually were a relatively successful socialist country. Um, for quite a while, they had a good, good growth, but actually... What happens every time one of these countries practices a socialist economy is it becomes unsustainable. In other words, you run out of other people's money. And they got all the way up to about the mid-80s, and then they couldn't sustain it anymore. They had a 450% inflation rate. Oh. And so they got rid of it, and they, they turned it over into a capitalist economy, and they've been thriving ever since. England did the same thing after World War II. The rest of England was referred to England as the sick old man, or had hmm. they had the English uh, disease because they had uh, the government owned communication and transportation and energy and all, I mean all the big industries and it was it was wrecking England so then Margaret Thatcher got into power right turned it all over wow yeah so uh, India same thing um, and a country like Venezuela which we know is kind of burning down because it just it hasn't been sustainable and it's been really mismanaged so there's really not a good track record huh. of countries who have had socialist economies short of communism mm -hmm. um, that have been successful and even israel was probably the best example of it and it didn't last for them they couldn't keep it up so when um troy when there's all this talk you know even to even in the news today mm -hmm. about the Democratic Party Democratic being uh, more socialism. How would it, how would your understanding of their brand of socialism compare right. to what you've just talked about in right. terms of an economy? Well, it's very interesting that you know they'll keep referring to places like Sweden, and Sweden is like, no, we're <laughs> we're not socialists. Mm -hmm. What they're really talking about is the kind of socialism that Len Marx and Lenin we're talking about, mm -hmm. which is which is Marxism, mm -hmm. which means uh, not only does the government own the means of production, but ultimately communism is described as the abolition of private property, mm. right? There's a lot to it. Uh, Vladimir Lenin said himself that the goal of socialism is communism, that there's historic kind of a arc to you have feudalism and monarchy capitalism, socialism, and communism. They see this as the natural flow mm -hmm. of human development. Um, the problem is it's this it's never worked very well. We, we know the stories of, of the bloodbath of the 20th century where uh, socialism evolved into communism. And so the thing that the left in the United States is proposing are things that are where the government takes over large industries we're talking about medicine now we're talking about in the green new deal they wanted to get rid of air airfare and put in light rail and um create jobs for for everybody and to have um you know uh, income for people who don't want to work um i mean all those kinds of promises are things that are very marxist yeah and then you look at movements like dare i say black lives matter where they talk about the abolition of the nuclear family that is straight out of the communist manifesto yeah, yeah. Uh, the abolition of, of you know, private property all these kinds of things so that the government becomes and the power becomes more and more centralized and so you might say that's like you know tinfoil hat talk but i'm telling you marx if you read his communist manifesto which i have read mm -hmm. good <laughs> re for you recently mm -hmm. um and the writing of Lenin, they are very clear that socialism is a, is inextricably attached to 
its development into communism. So what socialism does, and I'll, I'll get off of this here, yeah. mm-hmm. is the idea, it's the burning down of the existing institutions, whether that's governmental, whether it's religious, whether it's the nuclear family, whether it's gender roles, whether it's traditional marriage, whether it's uh, the way we approach taxes, all of these things. The idea is, and this is Marx was very clear, is to, you have to, and postmodernism is the same way, you have to abolish all these institutions so that the new egalitarian utopia can arise from the right. ashes. Yeah. There's okay. nothing competing with it, right? right. They've got complete and other right. power right. in the structure. And, and the and abolition of religion is key to this, because yeah. even Lenin said that uh, uh, communism begins where atheism begins, mm-hmm. right? So that's why you see it that this way in uh, China, right? Because they don't want a competing meta-narrative they don't need another God. The state is to be God. The state determines what is right, what is wrong, what you can have and what you cannot have. And um, we don't need another narrative telling people what the moral values are. Yeah, so, you know, um, uh, the founding of America, which all of us were that likely that are listening to this were born into. I mean, I don't know anything else. We know it's the best one because everybody seems to want to be here. This is right. a great place to be right. that was built on religious freedom <clears throat> right. and capitalism and a human initiative mm-hmm. and all of that, which I think are found, they, they're, they're, you find your roots in, right. in a, a Judeo-Christianity, right. obviously. And, um, and so uh, I think one of the challenges for parents with, with young people today is that young people are playing with fire and they mm-hmm. don't know it. Right. You know, they're liking some sort of a appeal of socialism because mm-hmm. all the young people and Hollywood people are mm-hmm. all into it, you know, so they're into it, but they don't really have not investigated what happens to a society when it right. takes it to its full to its full right. extreme and realizes I don't have freedom of religion anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I really don't have individuality anymore. And, uh, and another thing that you mentioned was really good is go back and look, uh, be, you know, do your homework and look at societies who have done this and how it's turned right. out. Right. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not so good. You can go over and over again, not just the Soviet Union. You can talk about, once again, India, England, New Zealand, any number of African countries who have all tried this experiment and it, it's unsustainable. It never works out and it always winds up uh, with poverty and very often extraordinary amounts of violence. And so we need to know our history. Yeah. We need to know, understand what it is we're buying into. It's one thing to say we want everyone to be equal. It's another thing to tr- engineer it to the point of, once again, creating this oppressor, oppressed narrative, which is what Marxism does. It's the root of all that, which all it does is divide people and minimize people and create more problems and more tension. Um, and then these countries, you just think about it like this, you know, countries that actually have practiced this are not, the hot tip is if you have to build walls to keep people in your country, mm-hmm. <laughs> they should tell you something, yeah, yeah, tell you, yeah. um, you know, versus keeping people out of your country, mm-hmm. you know, the places that are doing well, that have open markets that are flourishing. Well, they don't have any problem with people trying to immigrate into those countries. No one's mm-hmm. trying to get into North Korea or Venezuela Right. No one, no one wants to go there. It's not a hot spot. It's yeah. not, you know, it's not, those places are not places you want to travel to. And I've been to places that used to be, yeah. uh, like the Ukraine, mm-hmm. who used to be under Soviet power. And it's still, they're still dealing with the aftermath of that, just that desolate, godless, mm-hmm. um, empty philosophy. I'm watching my believing friends in Hong Kong, you know, oh, just boy. really overwhelmed with anxiety over China coming in faster right. than they ever anticipated, Oof. moving from their British control to to communist China control. Right. And they just know at the very foundation of it is the removal of religious liberty. And mm-hmm. the people I know in Hong Kong are committed believers in Jesus. Right. And they're going to have, uh, they know it better than anybody. So, so people that are considering it and playing with fire today in the United right. States, just, you know, yeah. You know, lift up your head and take a take a look at right. some of these it's things. It's not just about getting free stuff. No, it isn't. Yeah, because yeah. because nothing is free. It isn't free. Yeah. And you know, and I think that at the same time, Christianity is not about greed. Christianity is not about oh, the system enables me. Even in Acts chapter two and Acts chapter four, 
you know, a lot of times I've heard, I've heard people say that, you know, that, that the early church was promoting socialism because mm -hmm. people were bringing their resources and laying it at the apostles' feet. It never said no. that they were giving, they were taking a super valid poverty and giving it all to the yeah. church. Well, and they it wasn't were, coerced either. It wasn't coerced. Yeah. They, were, they, were, they were selling pieces of property they had. It doesn't mean they didn't have other properties or a primary residence. Mm -hmm. They were selling what they had and, and bringing it to the church to right. distribute to the poor. So we should be concerned about the poor, uh, but you don't have to go all the way. Uh, towards socialism right. on its way to communism. And just to kind of put the seal on this, or just keep, keep in your mind that this is according to Lenin and according to Marx, the goal of socialism is to, to lead you to communism. It's to create the fertile ground which communism arises. And from right from the Communist Manifesto, I'll just read this to you. It says, there are, besides eternal truths such as freedom, justice, etc., that are common to all states of society, but communism abolishes eternal truths. In other words, it abolishes freedom, justice, and etc. It abolishes all religion and all morality. Instead of constituting them on a new basis, it therefore acts in contradiction to all past historical experience. The goal is to burn down the existing systems and moralities, including your faith. Yeah. And so that's that, enough. That's a good stuff. That's good stuff. <clears throat> so how do we talk about... Um, other religions, right, yeah. besides Christianity. Yeah, I like that. You know, first of all, this is a big thing right now, and, um, you know, uh, universalism, even a lot of mm -hmm. Christian pastors, uh, even in Kansas City, this been it's, ha it's happened a few times, mm -hmm. and universalism is basically the idea that, you know, all roads lead to God, and at the end, everybody's going to be saved, and, um, and you know what, Troy? I like that idea. <laughs> right. I do. I mean, the idea that everybody... You know, gets right. in regardless of whether you pursued a god or no god at mm -hmm. all. Man, that's that's a cool idea. It's just not true. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's just there's just, just absolutely no way. Now here, I, here's something I think is really interesting. I'll tell you a couple things. Uh, one is that there's uh, three monotheistic, primary monotheistic religions mm -hmm. in the world today, and I'm suggesting that polytheism, the idea that there are multiple gods, means that none of them are God, because God, the, the very essence of being God is there's nothing to compare right. uh, him to, and so when you get polytheism and, and, and there's multiple gods, then there are demigods, but they're not gods, so monotheism is the only intellectual uh you know, religion, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and so there's three of them. There is a Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And it's interesting, all three of those religions root go back to one guy, mm -hmm. and his name is Abraham. So this is a really interesting deal. Yeah. You, when you read the Bible, you'll see this with when Abraham has Ishmael, and it, fa it, it starts this nation that ultimately becomes Islam that, um, that, that, that all go back to Abraham. So they... In reality, help me out here. I mean, mm -hmm. in reality, um, you know, the Judy, uh, Jews call uh, God Jehovah, mm -hmm. you know, Yahweh, mm -hmm. Adonai, you know. Uh, uh, Christians call him Jesus or Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity. And Islam calls him Allah. Right. Okay. They're referring to the God of Abraham. Right, so right. in many ways, those three monotheistic religions have all agreed there is only one true God. Mm -hmm. Where they differ right. is how do you enter into a relationship mm -hmm. with that God? And then, uh, and, and so for Christians, you know, this is really key. We believe that the Bible, the Old and the New Testament, is the full revelation of God to us, right. and it reveals to us the truth about the identity of the one true God, ultimately revealed in Jesus. The Jew, uh, Jews, or Judaism, the practice of that religion, you know, mm -hmm. stopped at the Old Testament, and obviously Muslims embrace the Quran, right? Mm -hmm. And they all talk about different ways to access God. Actually, the Old Testament and New Testament have a very similar, it's just it's not a complete story. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the Old Testament does not promote a works-based salvation. It does not and never has. Uh, it, the, the law was to be a tutor to get you to the place right. where you recognize that you needed a Savior uh, that is stopped in not recognizing the Savior. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's interesting that um, uh, not too long ago, last year, I think it was, uh, we had a gathering in Kansas City uh, where a bunch of um, evangelical pastors mm -hmm. got together with a bunch of rabbis and a bunch of imams, yeah. and we were going to actually do our retreat together, like a two, three-day retreat. And uh, I sat at a table with some rabbis and some imams mm -hmm. and some pastors, and it was so cool because we all agreed 
that the other one was wrong. <laughs> so you know you're not going to make it, right? right. Yeah, I right, know. Right. But now I can respect you, mm -hmm. uh, but you know that I think you're fundamentally wrong. Right. And so the people that are leading the three monotheistic religions in the world do not believe right. that everybody's going to make it at the right. end of the day. Universalism is, uh, right. is, is is not embraced by everything. Matter of right. fact, I'll tell you one other story. There was a lady uh, about a year ago here that was coming to West Side, and she would come, and then she'd stop coming. And, she, and every time she came, I really basically said, Jesus is the only way, and it drove her crazy. <laughs> and the reason it drove her crazy, because a personal story, she had a grandmother who was Muslim, and who has died and she felt like that their, that her grandmother who was Muslim was much more kind person than her own mother but every time she came maybe God's plan I declare that Jesus is the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except by me and uh, and finally um, finally in my last conversation with her I said you do know that your grandmother doesn't think you're going to make it you know mm -hmm. You, you could, because, because she doesn't think you're going to make it. So you're trying to defend her, saying she's going to make it into the eternal kingdom. She knows you're not making it into the eternal mm -hmm. kingdom. So I'm not sure why you keep uh, pressing this. The only way we could um, we could come up with universalism as a feel-good idea or the idea that all roads lead to one is that we would have to throw our confidence in the Bible out, which leads me to my final comment, and that is that's where we got a lot of work to do, mm -hmm. is that um, the church has not done a great job over this last 50 years at least in helping people to have confidence in their Bible, which is something, Troy, that you're going to be uh, leading us through yeah. here at Westside as, I think, a huge initiative mm -hmm. because where we get all this stuff from ultimately right. is anchored in the authority that we give to our confidence in the yeah. revelation of God's Word. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I, I would add to that, too, the people that are saying all roads lead to the same place is a really tone-deaf, intolerant, illiberal thing to say, because that means you're not listening to anybody else. You're, mm -hmm. You know, the Buddhists mm -hmm. don't believe that there is God. Hindus believe that there are thousands of God. Mm -hmm. The monotheistic religions believe there's there are one God, and even those are very different paths to that God. And it's what you're saying is you have a viewpoint that is more elevated than everybody else, mm -hmm. which sounds like you think you're being tolerant, but you're actually being really patronizing and really illiberal. I don't know if you've ever heard of the the parable of the blind men and the elephant. Okay, you tell me. Th okay, so so these these there's these four blind men and they're checking out an elephant, mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's one guy who's observing them, and uh, so one guy feels the elephant and he goes, oh, the elephant is like a tree and it goes up and down, and the other guy feels the side of the elephant, no, oh, the elephant is like a wall, and the other guy feels uh, the elephant's trunk and he says, no, the elephant is more like a snake, <laughs> right? And and the person telling the story says, you know, but they were all right, it was an elephant. The problem is the person telling the story mm -hmm. claims to know things and see things that the other guys can't see, yeah. right? So they're saying, I have a view of spiritual reality that is superior to yours, more mm -hmm. enlightened than yours. And I would just say this, everyone believes that their view is right, mm -hmm. you know? And, and w that's why we dialogue and we talk about these things. And we, we say, because you're, you're evangelizing me and, and I'm evangelizing you. The atheist over here is evangelizing me. The, uh, the Unitarian is evangelizing. Everybody has got a view that trying to sell. Mm -hmm. And as individuals, it's our job to try to ascertain what is true, what makes sense, what has the most explanatory power. And let me tell you, Christianity, of all the worldviews, secular or religious, is the only one that says that God has come searching for you. Yeah. Everyone else is performative. It's you trying to reach out to find God. Yeah. But God came to find you in the person of Jesus. I'm telling you, that makes all the difference. In the that world. is a great, great point. It is a great point. And um, I, um, you know, basically know that uh, this idea that, you know, it's a little bit of Gnosticism to say I have this sort of, um, you know, it, it, hidden insight that you don't have right. but also universalism as an idea um you know is basically getting us all off the hook you know from having to do the rigors of pursuing faith and all that if if they're all really good and, and ultimately some forms of universalism you don't even have to pursue god at all and it's going to all work out for you you're going right. to you're going to see it at the end of the day and you're going to like i love that idea i'll finish with that where i started i love that idea it's just that when you read the scriptures 
uh, the scriptures, you just have to throw the whole thing out mm-hmm. um, to, to, embrace, uh, right. or to embrace that idea. And if you look at the person of Jesus as the Christocentric lens through which we see everything, mm-hmm. you just have to determine that he was just he's either a lunatic or a liar. That's exactly. There's yeah. no other way. A lunatic or a liar, or he's our Lord. Remember he's that one? Lord, yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about this, what is the Bible thing uh, that you're thinking about doing? Oh, man. Okay, so this is so cool. Um, I'm really excited. I'm actually going to start doing this with my life group next know. week, you know, so it's really fun. Um, uh, you guys know the story, right, which is this uh, project that Randy led, this whole, like, journey through the Bible, the whole narrative of the Bible, and, and with this upper and lower story kind of viewpoint. Really, really cool. Mm-hmm. Well, he's got another project called Going Deeper mm-hmm. with the Story, which is it's teaching us, uh, one, how to navigate through this, this like, the... The journey of scripture through all these different touch points as it goes along with the up you know the upper story yeah. and the lower story or your story but also at the very beginning it's us got this really cool uh six session setup talks about the what is the bible yeah. how do how are we confident in the bible how do we how did scripture come into being the way we have it now yeah. and then how do we navigate it uh, and there are different ways of looking at it geographically. Mm-hmm. There's ways of looking at it through via these different timelines. And so it's a really interesting way of looking at the scope of Scripture through some different lenses that I had not really thought of before. And I'm really excited to yeah. watch some people through Yeah, I, you know, where did the Bible come from? Mm-hmm. How did we get the 66 books? And then mm-hmm. ultimately, how to engage the Bible? And it's our hope, uh, as we really dial up the discipleship mm-hmm. uh, uh track here at Westside is that we want every single person to be confident in their scriptures. We say, I say being from Texas, you know, we want them, we want them to wear in their Bible like they would a good pair of boots, (laughs) you know, and feel comfortable and confident and comfortable in it. And ultimately, when you get to that place, a lot of this noise that's going Mm -hmm. on in our culture, well, it just seems to fade away because we've anchored ourselves in authority. So we're not trying to just say, Hey, we know a lot about this and lean lean into our podcast. We're trying to ultimately right. equip you to eat uh, uh, a full meal from the Word of God and yeah. get confidence in yourself. Something the church has really not done a good job with. But golly, we're going to yeah. handle this. Yeah, and I'm really excited because I know how grounding and important that is for people. When I when I was I want to say 19 years old, I actually went through a really large faith crisis. And Did you? I wasn't sure that I believed. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, well, do I believe this because it's true, mm-hmm. or do I believe it because my mom told me so, you know, or a pastor told me so. And I actually ran into a book by a guy named Josh McDowell yeah. called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Mm-hmm. And um, and as I read that, I started to go, oh, there's something historic here. There's something tangible and concrete about this story. And, yeah. and you've got to determine what you're going to do with all that. But Evidence That Demands a Verdict, like what we're going to talk about with Going Deeper in the Story, talks about the historicity and the manuscript evidence and just the mountain of evidence that points us to how important scripture is and, and explains just how the church exploded yeah. in the first few centuries. And so I think it's going to be really important for people and hope that hopefully you'll get an opportunity to walk that, through that with us. Yeah, we invite you into it. Yeah. So here's a fun one. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about transgenderism and gender fluidity. <laughs> just, uh, oh, we should have quit while we were ahead. Yeah, no, no we, this is a real topic. It is getting late. It is. Maybe it, we, it, yeah. You, should we? Can we tackle it? Or are you want? No, uh, we can. I'm kidding. We. I, I, I hope. I was hoping to talk. About okay. It. Good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's, it's this is a hot topic. Maybe one. Uh, maybe a hotter topic than the the other ones in terms yeah. of what our kids are dealing with in mm-hmm. the, in the schools. And so I'm, I'm I've got some notes here. I'm going to kind of walk them through because I want to be super careful with my language mm-hmm. and. And, uh, and uh, you know, number one, I would say, how do we navigate gender validity? Number one, I think love has to be the supreme virtue in our families and in our life. And if that's not the case, the defense of the truth will come across as hate speech. Uh, right. and, and, uh, and I think 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and the writings of John, particularly the beloved, really talks about the prominence of love as the driver. Mm-hmm. And if love is not the driver, then it's just all clanging symbols and it's just a bunch of noise right, and, right. and and I think even hate speech today. So uh, before we get to the truth, we must lay down the idea that love has to be the driver. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when that's the case, then transformation can happen. Right. The goal is not to win an argument, transformation. Uh, a foundational truth that we come back to, this is one of the 
30 big ideas that mm -hmm. I've taught my kids, and that is that all people are loved by God and need Jesus Christ as their Savior. Yep. Therefore, because God loves all people, mm -hmm. uh, we need to love them too. So, uh, Troy, every morning I have a prayer time. I rehearse these 10, 10 of the big ideas, and I rehearse this one. It's just on humanity, God. You love all people, and so do I, and they need Jesus Christ. And I just think of a couple people that I really don't think are that lovable, and I go, like, you love them, though. Yeah. And uh, we're going to talk about this this week uh, when we start dealing with Jonah, and he just despised the Ninevites. <laughs> but turns out God loved them, and so yeah. should we. Uh, the next thing I would say is uh, in God's design, you know, when you embrace Scripture, coming back to that again, mm -hmm. as your foundational truth, things get a little bit easier uh, to wrestle with. You don't get uh, super confused about a bunch of things when you're looking at the design of God and you trust God as a good God. Right. God created them male and female, mm -hmm. uh, the book of Genesis says. Uh, and then it says later in chapter uh, 2, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. Mm -hmm. And this is God's design for perpetuating a healthy society, right. that a man knows he's a man and a woman knows a woman. They come together, they get married, and that's how you perpetuate it. And a healthy family is uh, ultimately the ultimate system of transferring love to other human beings. Mm -hmm. And we, we know that. I mean, who would, who in their right mind would want a little snotty-nosed toddler and you know, and, and all of their selfishness and poopy diapers, and and then they become teenagers. They don't even like you. Who, who in their right mind would spend one hundred and twenty thousand dollars on average from the age of birth to mm -hmm. eighteen on pe you know these kids as they're growing up. Well, a mom and a dad, God built that into the system. There's a wonderful scaling of, of two on two or two on three or just this incredible number with this built in love. It's just, it's the way in which it works. And then, you know, to state the obvious without being offensive, gender identity, God made gender of identification pretty easy. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty super duper easy. We don't need to get into that. It's pretty easy to determine. Right. But there are, in fact, on a very, very rare exception, mm -hmm. there are people that do have that. And I, I have that in my close circles where parents had to make a decision, mm -hmm. and that's the result of a broken, fallen world that we live in. That person didn't sin because of it. Just some things mm -hmm. mess up, but it, we're talking about a very— You're talking about intersex people. Yeah, you yeah. yeah, people yeah. that that are who yeah, have ambiguous— Ambiguous uh, deal, and they have yeah, to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that is a legit— that's a legit concern, mm -hmm. and we're living in a broken world. It's not going to be perfect into the new kingdom, and so we're going to have that like right. we do with lots of other things. It's such a small minority of people to turn that to where it's not even debatable mm -hmm. and, to, and, to, and to put themselves in the same shoes. I think that um, this is traumatizing our kids in a big way. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was growing up as a kid, you know, I just— I just wanted to be liked by the kids and, you know, whatever. And now kids are being faced with this decision right. like, wow, I, I thought I was I, – I can decide whether I want to be a boy or a girl. Right. I think not it, – it, that is just dangerous at the highest level right. of trauma, traumatization for uh, kids. And uh, I think one of the big things we're going to need to do as a church – so I think I've tried to lay that out, but trying to navigate it, ultimately the church is going to have to regain – leadership in the other domains of our society besides just the church mm -hmm. so we've given up the microphone and the leadership reins in education and right. media and i think education is the biggest one right now they mm -hmm. took over our education system years ago and i was a big big believer in the public school system i wanted my kids with their faith to be in the school system uh today if i were raising kids uh, I would have to think twice uh, about sending my kids to public schools. Uh, I would definitely not do it probably through junior high, and I was always against the Christian community segregating itself out mm -hmm. from the secular community. That's why we had our kids in public school, because I didn't want them to be separate from it. I think there's a lot of danger in that as well, right. but this idea that they're brainwashing our kids into this, yeah. in this environment, in my estimation, and again, it's a personal decision, I think is a bit challenging. And uh, I think our response uh, in, in navigating the, this culture that we're in now, we still have to maintain, as the New Testament completely teaches, back to the love, empathy, grace, intelligence, and tolerance for people. We need to love and learn how to love and disagree with people at the same time. You're going to have people in your family. And my path, path has always been 
um, I disagree with you, you know that, but you also, as a result, disagree with me, but it doesn't mean that we cannot be in relationship, doesn't mean that we can't be civil to one another, right. and so we need to do that. And um, I think if you have a child that you know gets infected by this and wants to shift, I would probably not go it alone. Mm -hmm. uh, that if they actually get into that, I would probably get some serious right. uh, professional help and counseling, uh, and uh, and uh, and and really have some people help work. I would I would not as a parent ever comply mm -hmm. uh, to that decision. For me right. personally, I'd like to hear, hear your response to that. Right. I did have a I did have a good friend of mine uh, growing up. His uh, daughter's name. Uh, you know, she, she went from a boy uh, to a girl, and um, they have maintained a love relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, she did it as an adult, though, and um, uh, and I think the idea is that you can love somebody and stand for the truth. I think this is ultimately going to play itself out to be a really devastating thing. Another thing going back to that we need to trust in God's plan. We need to think it's good. We do have a couple of rare exceptions here that we need to deal with tenderly, mm -hmm. uh, but making this a universal thing now is, right. is kind of crazy, and I think you, you you know this. And I think what's undermining the family today is the failure uh, of the nuclear family. Mm -hmm. uh, for 50% of the population, it has not worked. And uh, I think for us... You mean divorce. Yeah, divorce. Yeah, yeah divorce. 50%. So uh, we, have a, we have multiple generations of people now where a, a, a half of the people have come from broken families. Mm -hmm. And with that brokenness has comes tremendous pain. And so mm -hmm. the, the family is being, is being the, you know, the nuclear family that hasn't worked for many mm -hmm. people um, is undermining, I think, and is the driver of all this. And I think a good defense to this thing is a good offense. In other words, a good nuclear family that is supported by a, gro a broader group of people. Right. You know, a nuclear family in today's society is never intended to live on its own with a good support system that this is the way we, we raise healthy right. kids who can withstand this uh, gender fluidity right. in our world today. Well, I've got two high school boys and um, going to a public school and it's here in Kansas. It's not like no. they're in New York. And yeah. Uh, they they have friends who have declared themselves as non-binary, gender fluid, um, trans, any number of things. And I would I would say this: there's an enormous pressure in our culture to uh, not to get too deep into it. There's something called queer theory, which basically is meant to take uh, to disrupt norms. Anything is normative, so it's to basically it's to uh, declassify and and um, cloud things that have been normative and defined oh. and so so that's part of this whole critical theory thing yeah. we talked about one mm -hmm. of our first episodes and so there's this wave in culture that, that uh, there's everything is a spectrum everything is a rainbow of possibilities uh, the thing is is scientifically we know that sex is binary and mm -hmm. not to get too deep into that but it's pretty dang clear and of course there is the the intersex exception and and there but what's happened is there's this phenomena of very recently, especially of young girls who have in their in their adolescent years declared themselves to be trans. And you gotta understand that that is a very new phenomena. Mm -hmm. Gender dysphoria is a real phenomena that has been around for a long time. Typically, it's with boys feeling uncomfortable relentlessly and consistently with their own bodies and it manifests itself when they're very young. We're talking three and four years old. Mm. And it's persistent and parents observe that over the course of the boy's life. The phenomena we have now with young women or with teenage girls is that in just the last few years, girls declaring themselves to be trans is up 4,000% and getting, getting celebrated for it and uh, if anybody just decides that like maybe a parent or a doctor or somebody isn't celebrating it, then you are transphobic or repressive or regressive or something in some other way. So it's really, really hard. And what's happening is these girls are, they're going, they're kind of jumping onto a sociological bandwagon. Because yeah, yeah. young girls, okay, are typically more open to negative emotion. They're more obviously going to resonate with their friends. They have it, they tend to carry the emotional burdens of their friends yeah. to the point of they will distort reality yeah. in themselves to make their friends feel better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's like with anorexia. Any good uh, psychologist knows you, if you have a floor of uh, young women in, in a hospital, you don't put a couple of anorexic girls in the same room, right? right? Cause it reinforces yeah. the dysfunction, yeah. but with online mm -hmm. communities and chats and everything, there are always these online mentors in these communities that will say, you're so brave. 
you're so courageous for coming out and they will celebrate these girls who've never felt celebrated before yeah. and because they're miserable adolescents they're uncomfortable in their own bodies so there's a just a tsunami of forces pushing against them and in the show notes i'll put the name of a book for you by a gal named Abigail Schreier, who is not a Christian, but who did a ton of research in this regard that can be really helpful to you if you're navigating this kind of thing with your teenagers. But all that to say that, you know, are you, tra- am, am I transphobic? Are you pro-trans? Well, I'm pro-human. Yeah. I'm pro-people. And I want to love these people right where they are, just the way Jesus loves them. But Jesus loves you and I in our brokenness, and he loves them in their brokenness. But at the same time, I'm not going to tell you something is true when it's not and i'm not going to tell a child when i was when i was eight years old i wanted to be a dinosaur you know right. <laughs> i didn't get dinosaur surgery i'm not gonna yeah. tell a child that, that say well they feel most of the time when you see kids who have this kind of phenomena they actually wind up growing up to be gay right about at least 80 percent of them who, mm. who who exhibit this kind of uh, gender dysphoria wind up now how, however you feel about homosexuality is a different topic but the point is, it's something that is not to be taken lightly. It's not something to just, uh, a child doesn't know who they're going to be and what they should be. And Too just because, yeah, yeah, and they're not, it, I mean, we, we know better than to let kids make important decisions about something as tectonic as what sex they feel like they should be. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I would just encourage you to be gracious, be kind, seek like uh, everything that Randy said before about godly community, biblical community, grounding yourself in scripture. And then if as an adult, that person still feels like, you know, then they can make their own adult choices. But I would not reinforce this in children or adolescents in any way. Super dangerous. I think it's always good for us to end these conversations because, you know, we've tried to display truth and and you just gave a great, you know, not only biblical, but, um, you know, current information and and, th- and and good thinking out on this and and we just don't ever want to come across as insensitive mm-hmm. to people's stories and all that and you mentioned that that we you know we want to end every one of these with the idea that yeah we, we want to be able to bring out the truth and give you ways to think about it but uh, we are lovers of people because Jesus was a lover of people and we love people right where they're at First yeah. Corinthians 13 6 says this this is the great love chapter in the Bible it says love doesn't delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. So I'd say this, our posture is to walk in love, Mm -hmm. to celebrate the truth, Mm -hmm. rejoice in the truth, and and to embrace common sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm not gonna tell you that a man can have a baby. Mm -hmm. I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna agree with that. And I know the social pressure is huge to agree with statements like that. I'm not going to agree that because you're white, you are guilty for the sins of your ancestors 400 years ago. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say that because it's right. not true. That's right. And common sense tells you that more division doesn't bring about unity. Uh, berating people um, verbally and calling them names isn't going to bring about healing in relationships. It's common sense. Love is always the context. Rejoicing the truth and walking in wisdom and common sense has mm-hmm. got to be the place where we come out. Um, well, Randy, man, we've we bounced around a whole lot of stuff here. We did. <laughs> yeah, good stuff, though. I mean, yeah. it's going to be a little longer, maybe, podcast. Yeah. But, uh, I listen to podcasts like this all the time, and um, and uh, sometimes I do it in a couple settings. <laughs> <laughs> well, 1 Peter 3.15 says this, But in your hearts, revere Christ mm-hmm. as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Mm. Christ may be ashamed of their slander. In other words, live in such a way that though the world disagrees with what you believe to be true, they should want it to be true Mm. based on the love of Christ that they see in you and I. Amen. So, Randy, as always, we appreciate your time, your wisdom, your insight. It's really such a joy to do this with you. And I would tell our listeners to... Look forward to us uh, beginning this next season. It won't probably be for, for a few weeks, but it'll come up on these same channels on YouTube, on Podbean, on Apple, and on Spotify, and any, anywhere else you get your podcasts. In the meantime, we are going to be taking some of the questions that you submitted to us, talking about things like end times, mm-hmm. uh, gifts people. of the Spirit. There's a, a lot of people really interested theology. in that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, we're going to take a swipe at it and hopefully <laughs> not confuse you <laughs> and uh, bring clarity to these real issues that you walk through. So we just say, go follow Jesus every day of your life, honor him, love God, and love your neighbor as yourself. God bless you. We'll see you. 
We hope the conversation has challenged you and perhaps sparked some new ideas. If you'd like some additional notes and helpful links, visit the episode page at westsidefamily.church slash podcast. And if you have questions, we'd love to hear them. Our last episode of the season, we'll devote an entire show to your questions. So you can also tell us what topics you'd like to hear and discuss in the future. Thank you for joining us today and God bless you.